Come on in and have a seat and we'll get started as quickly as possible. When Carl McKean asked me to come out here and do a three-part presentation, I told Kyle, I said, Kyle, I said, you might come out there because I might need you. Uh, as it turned out, I really needed him because I lost my voice somewhere in the process. And uh, after I did the 8.30 session, that was about all I could handle. Kyle did an outstanding job at the 11 o'clock session. And he's going to continue with his presentation at this 3.30 session. What he intends to do is do about a 30-minute presentation and then I'm sure that you have a ton of questions that you'd like to ask. And we'll be up here and try to answer questions about anything that we have said or any question that you feel is uh, relevant to the whole situation. Again, I would reiterate that as far as the primary source material about what the Boston Movement teaches, again, I would recommend the Red Book. Um, this book has about 60 or 70 pages of text. But it has about a 130 pages of a, uh, appendix of primary source material, some of it which, honestly, we didn't see and did not have until three months ago. Uh, so if you want to see their material, I feel that's a, a good book to purchase. But uh, Kyle will come up and uh, try to continue some of the things he said or do the, continue the things he said and also uh, deal with a few other areas that have not been dealt with. Let's begin with prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for ACU. We thank you for the efforts that are putting forth to promote your kingdom in various places. We pray your blessings upon Brother Teague and others who have such a strong influence in this school. Father, be with Kyle. We pray that he will be able to present the material in such a way that we'll be able to understand and assimilate it and most of all, begin to act upon that which we understand and receive. Father, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the grace by which we've been saved. And we pray that we will trust in you the rest of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Somebody, I, I didn't know after the last presentation that anybody else was going to be in here after we were in here. And uh, somebody moved my material. Those of you who have preached or taught classes know how, what a critical thing can be when somebody moves your material. So I've been having to <laughs> recollect here for the last few minutes. Appreciate so much um, the opportunity that, that you have given us and that ACU has given us to come here and share this material with you. And as Jerry mentioned, um, he had had told me uh, some days ago, not knowing what Claudette's condition was going to be, that he needed uh, us to be ready to, to step in and help in any way that we could. And we've been thankful to, been able, uh, to be able to do that. In the last session, I was uh, ending up really uh, kind of uh, profanely trying to handle some fairly complex and, and uh, extensive material. I would like to try for the first uh, few minutes or 30 minutes or so of this session to convey to you a little bit more information, a little bit more fully an understanding of what a thought reform environment or what mind control is like and what people who have been in this type of system are having to deal with. I think that probably most of you want to, to help with the problem or you wouldn't be here would be taking the time to come to this presentation or the, or the two that had preceded it. And so that being the case, I want to be able to try to share some things with you that will at least give you some sort of orientation or some sort of feel for where do you go from here? How do I help? As I think Jerry has already alluded to and I, I was trying to stress in the time in the last session, one of the greatest needs that exist in our world today with regard to this problem is for individuals and for congregations to take seriously and take to heart the need to educate ourselves about this problem so that we can know how to help. I want to, to begin by reading a couple of things that I think have been helpful to me and been helpful to some other people in trying to understand this problem. 
How many of you, let me just take a, a quick preacher's poll here. How many of you have encountered someone, before you raise your hand, it's a, this is a double, two-part question. How many of you have both encountered someone who has come out of the Boston movement as a refugee and, having encountered them, felt uh, confounded, felt at a loss of how to understand them, felt like you didn't understand what they were trying to say to you or what it was that they, were, that they had suffered? You felt confused or troubled or in some way dumbfounded as to what to do to help. I think that <clears throat> illustrates how difficult it is sometimes for us to look over the chasm, so to speak, into the lives and the problems of people who experience, have experiences and struggles and trials that are different from our own and try to, to gain some sort of working understanding of what their problems are like, of what their needs happen to be. J. Wallace Hamilton tells of two officers of the Russian Air Force who flew their plane to a neutral zone, asked for asylum in America, and lived here for a while. But after a year or two, one of them could not take it anymore. He turned himself in to the Russian authorities, and they said, sent him back to Russia. The other who stayed in America wrote an article for a magazine explaining why. The article was entitled, Freedom Frightens Me. He said his friend went back to Russia because he could not face the exacting demands of freedom. Mr. Hamilton observed that man's return to a state of semi-slavery was, quote, a most illuminating revelation of what happens in the human soul when the religious basis of civilization is abandoned and the light of God is blown out. Accustomed all his life to having his choices made for him, he could not make his own. He was a lost soul in the frightening atmosphere of liberty. In other words, noted Hamilton, he was unfitted to be a man. Many who read this newsletter will have come out of, a, out of religious backgrounds almost as rigid as that of the Russian pilots. Accustomed all their religious lives to having their choices made for them, they find themselves hard-pressed to make their own. Some will reach down and find the courage to launch out in faith and make the decision to walk into the freedom, which is the inalienable right of every human being. Others will shrink back into the familiar state of religious or irreligious semi-slavery, preferring to have others make their decisions for them. In so doing, they fail one of the tests of life. I hope you think long and hard before you renounce your heritage as a human being, the freedom to live responsibly before God. It is a bit of the infinite dignity God possesses in himself and has bestowed upon a human being. Freedom, this likeness of God in ourselves, is risky business, but a gift of inestimable, an inestimable value. As you contemplate the decision which each, each person must make for himself or herself, realize that the freedom you have been given to act responsibly upon your convictions is an exercise of God's nature stamped indelibly in yours. Live free or die incurs risk and danger. But it also leads to dignity and fullness of life. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Many of you may be acquainted with the book written many years ago, and which has been published and republished and reprinted many times over and over again, written by Viktor Frankl entitled Man's Search for Meaning. Um, an excerpt from, from his book I want to read too to describe, try to describe to you the feelings of the person who comes out of a system of, of religious bondage and all of a sudden finds himself having to face choices and to face a lifestyle where these exacting demands of freedom are made on him. In describing the experiences of liberation, which naturally must be personal, we shall pick up the threads of that part of our narrative which told of the morning when the white flag was hoisted above the camp gates 
after days of high tension. This state of inner suspense was followed by total relaxation, but it would be quite wrong to think that we went mad with joy. What then did happen? With tired steps, we prisoners dragged ourselves to the camp gates. Timidly, we looked around and glanced at each other questioningly. Then we ventured a few steps out of camp. This time, no orders were shouted at us, nor was there any need to duck quickly to avoid a blow or a kick. Oh no, this time the guards offered us cigarettes. We hardly recognized them at first. They had hurriedly changed into civilian clothes. We walked slowly along the road leading from the camp. Soon our legs hurt and threatened to buckle, but we limped on. We waited to see the camp's surroundings for the first time with the eyes of free men. Freedom, we repeated to ourselves, and yet we could not grasp it. We had said this word so often during all the years we dreamed about it that it had lost its meaning. Its reality did not penetrate any longer into our consciousness. We could not grasp the fact that freedom was now ours. We came to meadows full of flowers. We saw and realized that they were there, but we had no feelings about them. The first spark of joy came when we saw a rooster with a tail of multicolored feathers, but it remained only a small spark. We did not yet belong to this world again. In the evening, when we all met again in our hut, one said secretly to the other, Tell me, were you pleased today? The other, and the other replied, feeling ashamed, as he did not know that we all felt similarly. Truthfully, no. We had literally lost the ability to feel pleased and had to relearn it slow, slowly. One day, a few days after the liberation, I walked through the country past flowering meadows for miles and miles toward the market town near the camp. Larks rose to the sky and I could hear their joyous song. There was no one to be seen for miles around. There was nothing but the wide earth and the sky and the larks' jubilation and the freedom of space. I stopped, looked around and up to the sky, and then I went down on my knees. At that moment, there was very little I knew of myself or of the world. I had but one sentence in mind, always the same. I called to the Lord from my narrow prison, and he answered me in the freedom of space. How long I knelt there and repeated this sentence, memory can no longer recall. But I know that on that day, in that hour, my new life began. Step for step, I progressed until I, again, became a human being. The kind of bondage, the kind of constraint and imprisonment that people who are coming out of religious oppression are having to deal with is exactly the same kind of condition or the kind of struggle that Frankel describes, that those Russian pilots had to contend with as they, having been accustomed, become uh, totally used to a system where freedom did not exist for them, they were turned loose and didn't know how to be human beings. The Boston movement has a formula for godliness that essentially says your effort plus the work of, of the discipler in your life equals godliness. And in fact, the end aim of godliness is this idea or ideal that is, that is set before people that you can be like God. I hope we can recognize the danger not only the violence that is done to biblical truth, but the violence that is done to human beings when we embrace that lie. 
That was the first lie that was told, if you recall. That was the lie that Satan told Eve in Eden. You can be like God. You can be more than a human being. You see, God's really just holding back something from you. If you'll find some special enlightenment, some special dispensation of knowledge, you can be more than human. And the problem with that is that the liar can never deliver what he's promised. The fact is, after all is said and done, and after all of the main strength and awkwardness that we might exert to try to become more than human, we still find ourselves short of ever being like God in the sense that was promised to us. I would to God that in the church today, we would make it our aim make it the focus of our energies to begin to try to learn what it is to be the people that God has already called us and made us to be rather than flagellating ourselves and berating and beating on ourselves for what we are not yet that we need to become. I believe I can say to you honestly that if I had to weigh the, the collective or cumulative weight of teaching that I, have, that I have felt and experienced in my lifetime growing up in the church, I would have to say that more of that teaching was weighted on making me feel like I'm not yet what I need to be than on teaching me how to be what the Lord has made me to be. And so we, we pursue this ever-elusive goal, this ever-elusive dream that we, that we continue to, to have held out before us that we're going to someday, someway, somehow be something. Maybe we're not even always sure what it is that we're trying to become, where it is that we're trying to go or get to. And all the while, we end up squandering our lives and wasting our time, never really knowing how to enjoy what it is the Lord has made us to be through his son. And the people who are coming out of this experience of bondage are ill-equipped and ill-fitted to be a forgiven, blood-cleansed, spirit-filled human being. We don't know how to be human and be secure with the Lord. And that's not just people in the Boston movement. I'm afraid... So many of us, you know, have bought into this, this kind of thing that we're so afraid that we're going to teach once saved, always saved, that we've conveyed to our people the message of if saved, maybe saved, or if saved, barely saved. And, and brothers and sisters, if that's going to be all that we have to offer people who are coming out of this, we might as well leave them alone, let them go look for help somewhere else, because we're not going to help them. In the 11th chapter of Matthew, Jesus, I think, conveys to us the burden that he had for people who had suffered under the bondage of religious slavery. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. Is there any place in the New Testament, any place in all of the gospel accounts that Jesus makes a sweeter invitation than there? See, that's the invitation that he gives to you and to me. It's also the invitation he gives to people who are coming out of the Boston movement. A few months ago, I did a workshop in a congregation someplace. I won't tell you where. 
And a man came up to me after one of the presentations, and I was trying, I had just finished presenting some of the material about some of the psychological issues, the emotional damage, and, and you know, where people are who come out of, of a mind control environment. And he started in on me, and he was, he was basically dressing me down for the idea, well, if we'd just get back to teaching the scriptures, we wouldn't have to talk about all this psychological mumbo-jumbo. And then he, then he started in on Jerry. And he said, I don't know what ever happened to Jerry. He should have been smarter than to have invo gotten involved in something like this. Well, I used to drive miles and miles to hear Jerry Jones speak, and I wouldn't walk across the street to hear him speak today. You know, if you ever pray for patience or you pray for the Lord to give you self-control, uh, I think he sends you people like that. Um, I was standing there fighting this tremendous battle within myself, you know, not to just absolutely lop this guy's head off because, you see, he was exhibiting to me uh, an attitude that said, uh, caution, this person could be hazardous to anyone who's come out of an oppressive religious experience. Not only did he not understand the pain and the need of someone who's gone through this experience, but he doesn't understand the fact that people who get involved in cultic experiences, people who get involved in oppressive and enslaving systems in the name of God are not just weak-minded, defective people of some sort. In fact, if, if any of you think that you are impervious to ever being controlled in a manipulative system such as we're talking about here, you're sadly mistaken. And I told this brother, I said, well, one of the things I will say to you is that my prayer to God is that nobody who's a refugee from the Boston movement will ever encounter you asking for help. Because I have seen too many situations where people have come away from the Boston movement, they've been bleeding and wounded, and the lifeblood of their faith is running out before their very eyes on the ground in a pool of goo around their feet. And they're going out looking for somewhere, someplace, somebody to manifest the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus to them. And what they have met with, met with instead of that is someone who said, boy, I don't know, what, what is your agenda for us? Are you trying to take over our church? If you were to teach one of our Bible classes, what would you be teaching? And here we go with our list of questions. And those people basically respond, if I need an inquisition, I go back to the movement. I'm just looking for a place to survive. And many of those people having encountered our dogmatic and bigoted spirits and coming out of the movement and coming into some of our churches have gone away and crawled in a hole and died in their faith. And their blood is not only on the heads of the people who oppressed them in Boston. Brothers and sisters, I beg you and plead with you to please understand that when people come out of this experience they may say things they may talk a language as Jerry was saying earlier in the first presentation that you don't understand they may look kind of odd or strange or weird to you they may still think that they're supposed to be jacking it up cranking it out and making it happen and that kind of thing and they may come to you with with words that may frighten you. But please understand, these people are busted up and in need of extensive first aid, spiritually. They need your love. They need your receptivity. They need your acceptance. They need patience. They don't need platitudes and sermons. They generally need somebody who will be willing to listen to them and, and simply to be able to remind them because we know the power of the grace of God through Christ. Even if all we can say is, I don't know if I understand what you're going through, 
But I believe in time that you'll be all right. If that's all you can give them, give them that. If you don't know what else to give them, Jerry or I or Monique or Maria or Jim or some of us can help you find somebody who might know a little bit better how to minister to them. Feel free to contact us. But for the sake of God and His mercy, please don't beat on these people anymore. They've had all of that that they can take or they wouldn't have left the movement. Some of what the reading that I, that I shared with you out of, out of Victor Frankl's book, some of what that is conveying is so characteristic of people who come out of this experience. They don't know how to feel many times anymore. They've been so OD'd on hype and emotionalism many times that their emotional affective side is comatose and near death. Many times they couldn't tell you what the foundations of their faith are any longer. Many times they couldn't tell you if you said, what, what things do you believe in? If they can tell you they, they still believe in God, they're doing pretty well. This system of manipulation and enslavement is so destructive and onerous that it literally is dismantling people at the hinges and ripping their personalities and their, and their personal identities to shreds. Please keep that in mind if you encounter some of them and they're needing your help in ministry. The greatest recommendation I can make to you about how to minister to them, as I said earlier, is to learn how to listen. And sometimes those listening skills are going to require you to sit and hear things that will sound maybe like utter nonsense to you. But what mercy demands of us is that we, that we understand that we, it may take us a while to decipher what they're saying, but that we can simply learn to listen. I want to close out this part of the presentation before we open up for questions. And if you have questions, you might want to be writing them down, writing some of them down. I want to read to you a couple of pages out of the diary of a young woman She writes this at a time when she's trapped in the movement. She's married in the movement and she doesn't know how to get free. This is two pages long and it's almost one, in one continuous run on sentence. I want you not only to listen to what she's saying, but I want you to listen between the lines to the tremendous spiritual, emotional, and mental anguish out of which this girl writes. I am so torn. I am not happy. I know I should do one thing or another, but I can't make a decision. I have a terrible problem in that area. I can't even decide what to have for dinner. I think that if I wasn't married or had children, I would just want to die somewhere alone. But that would be wrong for my girls. I don't want them to grow up with doubt that I love them or of guilt in any way. And at the same time, I don't want to follow God because I feel I need to for my children or for my husband. I don't have a love relationship with God. I have a cowardly fear of him, a fear of what he is going to do to me next for not doing this or that. I feel very hurt, a deep ache I have never felt before with my dad dying, at a pain in my heart that I can't seem to get rid of. 
People say, I need to give it to God. I don't know how to give it pain to him. I understand giving him worry or something like that out of faith, which I have next to zero of. But can pain be given to him as well? I don't know. The Bible says all things work to good. I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't see it. <coughs> I am a quitter at heart. I always want the path of least resistance. How do I decide? Either way, I see pain. If I quit, eventually my husband and I would end up separated. Then our children would suffer. But if I stay, I'll always have this question hanging over my head. Why am I doing this? Is it just for my children or for the path of least resistance? I know it would be a pain to quit. Other people would bug me to death until I finally would pack up and leave. But everywhere I would want to go, there would be people who would bug me to come back. I would be on the run. My husband would always have to be in the picture because of the children. I would have to get a job and be away from the girls. That is, if my husband didn't fight for custody of them. But either way, I couldn't spend much time with them. I feel trapped. I know I'm just being totally selfish. My poor husband has to put up with a wife who is totally unsupportive of him and his goals. That is the problem. His goals are not my goals. I don't have goals, which is bad in and of itself. I am a very self-centered person. Woe is me. I am always thinking of a day, of a, in parentheses, daydream, that something would happen to me so I would get sympathy, like breaking my leg. I guess I am a masochist at heart. I have a tendency to categorize people, either the person who seems to have it all together or the one who is worse off than I am, which in reality is not true because I'm just as bad, if not worse, or the one who is like me. This is so hard because I know all the answers. I need to do right or leave, but the decision to do one or the other is next to impossible. I am so torn, I want someone to make it for me, but then I would use that as an excuse. I am so unhappy. How do I make this a personal decision? My first thought is to leave, get far, far away. But could I ever get far enough away to ever be happy? What is joy? The Bible says the only way to have it is to be with God. But I don't want to have to do all the things it takes to be with God. I am lazy. I have no motivation except that I accept what I've been running on, on empty, guilt. Guilt of what I thought of. What do I do? Now you tell me, what do you tell her? This kind of anguish and confusion and unhinging of the person is not the exception. This is the rule. I'd like to say in closing, sometimes people have asked me the question, what is the one, if you had to boil it all down to one thing that you would tell someone as to, as to why they shouldn't get involved in the Boston movement, what would it be? I have two answers for that. One is the distortion of of their theology and the fact that in my personal view they don't even worship the same God I worship. But in terms of, of practical application the thing that I have to say to people when they ask me that question is if there's one thing that I would that I would say is the greatest area of danger and and uh, destruction to people it is the in the area of the destruction in the lives of women and children in this movement. A lot of people are attracted to the Boston movement today because they on the outside appear to be doing a great deal in the area of making progress and in, in ministering to the needs of women and in establishing women's ministries. I think at one level they should be commended for that but I want to caution you that what appears to be a very fine, running, smooth, operating, well-refined women's ministry is nothing more than a sophisticated piece of machinery that keeps the women enslaved to the whims and, and 
the, the tides of the wishes of the men. Women are the slaves of the men, and particularly they are made the sex slaves of the men in the movement. Now that may sound pretty stark. If you want to know why I've come to that conviction in detail, I'd be glad to share with you the material that convinces me in detail that that is the case. The experiences that we've gone through, I would, I would do it if I could take it back. But I can't. When your wife looks at you one day and she says, if this is what I've got to do to go to heaven, then I'm going to hell because I can't live this way anymore. I think you'll understand that of which I speak. Let's um, take the remaining time, if we could, to feel questions. And Jerry and I both want to open ourselves up to your questions. So, uh, I suggest you stand up and state your question loud enough for everybody to hear, please. We need to make sure we're talking. David Widener is with the Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, he is. Yeah. David Widener is with the Indianapolis Church. Glenn Drysdale is working with the Boston Church in St. Louis. The question is, where was, where is David Widener and Glenn Drysdale? The question is, uh, we've, we've summarized the problems, talking about some of the things that we need to be implementing. Uh, the little book I put together called Back to the Basics deals with a lot of the things that I learned on how to <clears throat> use small groups in evangelism. Uh, that, I think, is important. I feel that they have uh, pioneered some ways to show us that, we can, that large congregations can be built without church buildings in large cities. And also the idea of the economical use of renting facilities rather than building buildings. I think that's one of the things we used. Uh, the use of small groups, whether you call it house churches or Bible talks, I think they've, they've helped that way. So those, to me, are some of the good things. Uh, they've emphasized the idea of having one-on-one -on -one relationships. Uh, this, I believe, is something that we need to have. Now, we need to realize that anything that's good can be abused. Let's take the doctrine of grace in the New Testament is, I believe, a classic example. And so I am not opposed to discipling. I'm not opposed to small group Bible studies. Uh, I'm opposed to the abuse of those things uh, that I would summarize. I'd just like to add a couple of things to that. Um, one of the best things that you can do uh, to help is before you start trying to do anything is educate yourself. Um, I think that's where a lot of harm in the name of good has been done is that we have, again, as I mentioned in the last session, we've been more uh, urgent about trying to do something without figuring out what it is that we should do. And I appreciate your question. I, I'm sure it's coming from that area. I want to uh, recommend real quickly a few books to you, and I think Jerry may have mentioned some of these earlier, but Danny Dixon's book, Discipling Ministries and Inside Look, is one of the finest brief treatises on, on the legalistic core problem um, of the movement that is in print. Um, as I, as I mentioned before, the book by Steve Hassan, Combating Cult Mind Control, is a, is a masterpiece as far as the way it, can, it brings together so many different dimensions of material. And there is an extensive bibliography of resources listed in the back of that. Um, there's a book published by the American Family Foundation called Cults, What Parents Should Know. If you have friends, relatives in, in the movement, not only in the Boston movement, but in any, any other destructive sect, this book is, is a very good resource to have. And then lastly, I'd like to say in this, along this line, if you're not at all acquainted with any of the um, 
the currently available material on concepts such as codependency, shame, shame-bound families, uh, addictive issues of various kinds, addictive families. Avail yourself of some of the good material that's available. Now some of the material that's out there is not so good and some of it's very heavily loaded with, with a bunch of new age garbage. But some of the material that's available uh, in speaking in terms of um, codependency, shame, and shame-bound families is excellent. Melody Beatty's book, Codependent No More, is, is an outstanding work on understanding the problem. This matches, I mean, the, the codependent model matches what happens uh, en masse in uh, a manipulative sect. All, all that you have to do is take her principles that she's applying to families and expand that to the church family and you've got a working model of the problem. Uh, this book by Merle Fossum and Marilyn Mason, Facing Shame, Families in Recovery, uh, is an excellent resource. These people write from a very theologically positive perspective and um, it's, a, it's an excellent book in understanding the problem. And one other that I would mention that I didn't bring up here is uh, John Bradshaw's book. You have to really wade through some of it and there are quite a few bones you have to spit out, but um, his, his book, um, <laughs> Healing, Healing the Shame That Binds You, went blank there for a second, is, is a very good book. Uh, these kinds of systems are perpetuated with the mechanism of shaming people and manipulating them through making them feel shame. So those resources are very good as far as uh, resource materials. If you want more along that line, feel free to see us afterwards. There are other materials that can augment some of these things that we can point you to. Okay. What was his last uh, He said, uh, I indicated that anybody is vulnerable to a mind control system. Would I mind sharing some of the things that led me into the system? Uh, I'll let Jerry comment on this too. I, mean, I, I would say the reason above all reasons was naivete. Just being un, unaware and naive as to how this kind of collectively enforced manipulation occurs. It's, it's interesting in my situation because <clears throat> my brother was in uh, a group of this nature back in the early 70s. And at that time, our family had read a lot of the available material that was available at that time trying to understand this same kind of issue. So I thought I was educated, but I wasn't because I never expected Hmm? Yeah, I'm, I want to get to that. Molly's making sure I get, get it all said on one other point. But uh, I was naive as to how those things could be done uh, with what I felt was, even though it might have some problems, what I felt was uh, the Lord's church. You know, we, did, we didn't expect those kinds of things to happen. or I don't expect those kinds of lies to be told by people who present themselves as being the church. And that may sound kind of, well, uh, how dumb of you. Maybe it sounds like that to you, but we're all su uh, subject to falling into that. Another thing is the, the level of enthusiasm and the results that they were having. And as I was saying last, uh, last session, given our, given our system model of how we have typically taught people to define the church and how we should see God and that type of thing, I thought, well, they're really serious about doing what we say we're supposed to be doing. So obviously, I want to go learn what they're doing. I didn't go into this thing to get involved in something that would literally take over every dimension of my life. In the beginning of chapter 6 in Steve Hassan's book, he, he makes a statement, it's an anonymous quote. He says, nobody joins a cult. They simply postpone leaving. And that's the best way I know how to convey it to you if, if I had known somebody was going to rob me of my, of my liberty in Christ, I would have never gone anywhere near them. 
But I didn't realize that going in. Again, naivete as to how these kinds of things happen. What is mind control? How does it work? And how do people get sucked into it? I, I was not pragmatically and practically equipped to either identify it or know how to combat it when I met it. And so, and our brotherhood is, and not just our brotherhood, our whole nation is terribly naive about this. If we could go through a list of all of the misconceptions people have about how one is recruited and, and sucked into a cultic group, I think it would illustrate that even further. You know, we think anybody gets involved in this must be weak-minded or defective or they must have had a, a really uh, rotten education in the scripture or that kind of thing. And that, that's just not true. So those are some of the factors that, that contributed to my being led into it. And as I, as I shared last session, a level of frustration that I was feeling in my life at, at a particular time with the ministry experiences that I'd had that I felt like, you know, I don't know, I don't know what I need to find, but I've got to find something better than what I've been doing. And then, you know, Satan's always good at coming along and saying, come this way, this will be the way, in the name of what is good. Part of the thing which um, Kyle is describing within the Boston movement has to do with your accepting certain definitions. And that is a definition of what is a disciple. Uh, with the idea of disciple, there's a strong, strong stress on imitation. We're talking about total imitation of another person. We're talking about imitation to the extent of even of their flaws. Not just their imitation of Christ. And that can be documented. That's in the book. It's a direct quote. If you accept that, basically what you're doing is you're surrendering your thinking to someone else. And that's part of a concept of mind control. Another strong emphasis in the Boston movement is the idea of disloyalty. And the emphasis on loyalty. That is, brother, if you're loyal, you know, you'll back me on this you're, and you're not going to undermine me at all. So the word loyalty is a very strong buzzword. The idea of seeking advice, which we need to learn to seek advice. But you see, they have the idea that you not just seek advice from other people, you seek it from one person and you don't have an alternative over the night you take it. It's emphasized that way. Then also your rise in leadership which leadership is very important in the Boston movement. In fact, in some ways, not stated by them, leadership is even more important than your salvation. Because if you don't rise in leadership, then there's something wrong with you. Now, to rise in leadership demands a total subservient to the person who's immediately above you. If you're bucking that person up there, I guarantee you, you won't rise in leadership. You'll go the other way. Plus, the language is loaded. The language is loaded. I could take any three of those women there, Molly, Monique, and Maria. Even though they have been out for a period of time, out of the Boston movement, If I wanted to this hour, I could just about do it. I might fail with them because they've been out so long. But if I could get to them just as they came out, I could lean over and start in on them with buzzwords. And I could start telling one of them, Sister, you're independent. You're unteachable. You're rebellious and not submissive. And I can bring them to tears in a few minutes. Because you see, you don't understand the loaded terminology and the concepts behind those words. Because those are the buzzwords many times that keep the person from expressing what he views and having an open form because he has basically surrendered his thinking. So I would say and answer your question, if you accept certain definitions and understand how the language is loaded, which is also lifting one of his criteria, then you can understand how mind control and surrendered thinking can take place. Let's go this way. I'm going to hand over. Is there a list available in Boston affiliated churches? Um, the question is, is there a list of Boston affiliated churches in America? Not one. 
list that I know of will be up to date. Now, Flavel Yankley put the same things in the back of his book which needed to be corrected because he had some listed back there that were not true because some of them took a stand later on against uh, uh, Boston. But I could not tell you a list. I think between the two of us, we could tell you whether it was or not in any place in the country. I got it right here. Then I'll go. go ahead. You're next. Identify what you have already identified to keep us out of such a movement. You understand my question? Okay, the question. Did you and Kyle became aware of the fact that you were in something that was controlling you other than the God that we need to be working? I'm going to let you answer first or my voice is failing. Repeat the question, can you? Uh, well, well, you go ahead and repeat Okay, the question is uh, what can we do to recognize these things in other places? so that other people don't fall into the same trap. Um, again, I think that we have to I think that we have to address some of those areas that we have in common with Boston. Uh, I think we're going to have to to be willing to start asking ourselves the question about the things that we teach and practice. Where is this leading? Where's this going, where's this going to, to take us? Um, I think that we also have to give ourselves room and time to, uh, to think about things such as that before we act. I think if we could let off the pressure, some of the pressure that we put on ourselves to, to feel so compelled to move into action lest we feel like we are spirit abandoned churches and give ourselves time to uh, to learn how to listen to the Lord and I'm not talking in some kind of mystical terms here I'm just simply saying learn how to seek the Lord and seek his guidance and and wait on the Lord sometimes to give us answers before we jump to conclusions I'm convinced that it is this obsession, this uh, um, compulsion that we have had to get results and to move into action that led us so far down this pike so quickly. I know it is for me that that feeling driven uh, to to need to get results, and so consequently, you're you're in motion. You're you're at in such a rapid state of motion that you don't have time to evaluate the things that are flying by you on either side. So I guess, in a real practical sense, this is what we're doing as we're trying to do workshops and do presentations like this, is alert people to these kinds of, the existence of these things. I think the main thing that our people need to be inoculated about this is just a, a good, thoroughgoing education about the existence of this kind of problem, how susceptible we all are to it, and uh, how to identify manipulation when we see it. We're all manipulated one way or another all the time. And many times we don't know how to put our finger on it when it's happening to us. A lot of times we feel uh, in our consciences, we feel something is, is wrong or is amiss when someone is manipulating or controlling us. But because we have allowed other people the right to hold positions where we justify them treating us that way, uh, we don't question. So I think a good healthy dose of learning how to question all things and say, by what authority? By what authority do you speak? Um, if we could teach our children that, that's what I want to teach my children as they grow up in this world where manipulation is so common. Other than the doctrinal issues that I just hit the top of today, I think the telltale thing that I, I see in myself and others, everybody that I've ever talked to basically came out of this, used some similar terminology in the sense they felt free for the first time in their lives. They felt there was a bondage taken off. And they felt free to be themselves. And they felt free to express themselves. And many of them described their leaving, and some of them stole away in the middle of the night. Literally. Literally stole away in the middle of the night. They described themselves as escaping from a prison. And that's why when I began seeing Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. That became so much clearer to me. Question there. Uh, last 
Pastor Gardner, though, you can see it today, uh, he voiced some of the same concerns about the crossroad business about 10, 15 years ago. My question is, has this Boston movement totally supplanted or swallowed up that food? Or do we have two segments that we were concerned about? Okay, the question is, has the Boston movement totally uh, swallowed up the, uh, the crossroads movement per se as such? My response to that is, I believe the seeds of what's in the Boston movement were planted years ago. But it was my conviction, and I started hobnobbing with these boys in 1978. It was my conviction that as I sat down and talked with the leaders, that they had it on straight. But it was the lower levels that were getting it messed up. And as long as I felt the leaders had it on straight, then I felt I would live with the mistakes. I feel when I went to Boston, the leaders there had it on straight. I mean, I had too many conversations with them. But their doctrinal positions changed from August of 1986, in my opinion. I felt the potential was always there. But I never thought it would be realized because I was felt there were enough safeguards. Uh, so when you talk about the crossroads movement, that is completely out. Were the seeds back there? The answer is yes. But crossroads in Gainesville, Florida is as totally opposed to what Boston stands for and what they believe as Kyle and I are. And they're on tape as a record of that. Let me add one thing to that too, and that is that uh, there are a number of congregations, ours being one of them in DeKalb, the post-Boston churches. Uh, and, and Crossroads is one of those congregations now as well. As far as we know, as far as Jerry and I and Jim and Monique and Maria, all of us who know people in these various churches, as far as we know, all of our congregations are going through a tremendous time of, of um, post post-trauma distress, whiplash, backlash, uh, disorientation, having to completely reorient ourselves to what it is that we're supposed to be being about. I, I think that we do err if we kick against that. Uh, I was saying to some people earlier today, I, I think that uh, this is a positive wilderness time for all of our churches, the, the congregations that we're working with where we can, once again, in this period of time where we feel maybe like we're wandering around in the wilderness, maybe we can meet the Lord at Horeb again. Because that's what has happened to our churches is that we've gotten away from dependence upon the Spirit and become very dependent upon the flesh. And we're having to learn all of that over again. It takes time. Okay. I want to give your name. They need questions. Okay. Okay. You close out and let me do something. Okay. If you have other questions, uh, we're, we're out of time, but uh, feel free. What, what is the status of the movement now? Is it in remission or is it still like cancer growing? Uh, it's, it's moving faster and faster down the track with an ever increasing head of steam. Now, there are more and more people uh, falling off the train, some jumping for their lives, looking for a soft place to land and not always finding one. But. Uh, the machinery is moving at an ever-increasing rate of speed. I think if, if, uh, if any of us decide that what we want to see happen is just by wishfully thinking this is all going to dry up and blow away, it's not going to just dry up and blow away. It may blow up one day but uh, from overstressing the boilers, so to speak, but it's not going to just go away. And even if it blows up, we're talking about a level of spiritual carnage that I think our brotherhood is totally ill-equipped at this point to minister to. So, we're, we're going to have to stop. Jerry's telling me I've got to stop. This is, his, his name's on the schedule, so I'm going to obey my disciple here. Um, I would just like to say, if you, I know some of you, many of you have friends and relatives and, and loved ones who are, are in the movement. If you want to know more about how you can personally help them specifically, we would be glad to talk to you uh, about that privately. Uh, let me just give you my, uh, my phone number. Uh, that's Kyle Degg, D-E-G-G-E. -G -G -E. And my phone number is area code 815-758. 
Uh, Jerry's phone number is listed in the back of, of his of all of his books. It's but I'll go ahead and give it to you. It's three one four seven three nine six four three four. He's you, yeah. <laughs> but both of us have answering machines, and and either of us will be more than happy to help you in any way, and and that includes Monique and Maria and. Uh, and a number of other people that we could refer you to. But if you have particular situations like that you need help with, please feel free to get in touch with us. And we'd be more than happy to help as much as we can. Also, uh, we're going to be around here afterwards. We have another meeting soon after this. But if you have some questions, we're here. Uh, Marie and Monique, why don't you stand up again so they know. These are two that were part of the movement. You want to talk to them? Jim's down here. Stand up. Jim was uh, an evangelist to last month, and he was... Uh, defrocked or whatever it is last month from the Boston movement Uh, so if you want to have questions if you can't get to Kyle or myself you can get to these three and they'll be very helpful in uh, answering the questions I hope it's been informative to you I hope it's been helpful to you Um, it's not something we came here with a great deal of delight to present but if it's going to be presented we want it accurately fairly done in the spirit of Jesus Christ Um, we get upset And you get upset, too, if you have to deal with what we have to deal with nearly on a daily basis. We are concerned. But we are committed not to make this the heart of our ministry. We don't want to do it. We we feel that Jesus dealt with the problems and situation his day, but he never let the false teachings of the Pharisees or Sadducees keep him from a commitment to the will of God. And that's where we are. And that's where we want you to be. We believe that's right. And we believe that's biblical. And don't make it your ministry to try to straighten out all this. We're just trying to get you equipped to handle the people. This book that I've written, I tell in the book that you have every right to be part of the Boston movement if you want to be. But you better know what you're buying before you buy the farm. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep them from recruiting any more of our people out of our churches and out of our schools to be part of what they're doing. And I'm going to try my best to keep from doing that. I have met these people face to face and dealt with them and tried to convince them. But they're basically unshaken. There are a lot more things we want to say um, and a lot more things that could be done. But hopefully this gives you some idea of what it's all about. And I hope you go away with a greater desire to serve God, a greater desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a greater desire to be what God wants you to be in your community. And if you go away with that feeling, then we've accomplished something. Because that's what we want to accomplish more than anything else in this world. But there's some way we can be of help to you. We're here to do it. Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunities. And we pray for wisdom because we feel so stupid most of the time. And how, Father, help us to direct our minds and our lives to be what you want us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.